I'm Ed Murrow. The time was May 1941. Britain stood alone. Convoy sinkings were increasing. When Bismarck, the most powerful battleship in the world, broke out into the Atlantic and sank the hood. Bismarck had to be sunk if Britain was to survive. Winston Churchill gave the order. I don't care how you do it. You must sink the Bismarck. This is how it was done. Before Bismarck was built, we have to go back in time. There was a treaty that was put in place, and this limited the size of warships for the US, Britain, Japan, and Italy, and also France. This was called the Washington Treaty, and this was designed to limit ships to a certain amount with their guns so that they wouldn't be a massive arms race. But what happened was that one country didn't sign this. Hitler. And what happened was that Hitler didn't follow the rules and didn't follow any treaties and broke up the Treaty of Versailles, allowing him to make bigger armies, tanks, planes, you name it. And what happened was that he said Bismarck was 10,000 tons which was, I think, the limit of the Treaty of Versailles. However, in reality, he was over 50,000 tons and had eight 15-inch guns. Larger than that on the Prince of Wales, larger than that on Rodney. She was ready for war. And war did happen. What happened was that Hitler went to war. And in 1939 to 1941, he swept through Europe, claiming Czechoslovakia, Poland, France, Belgium, you name it. He swept through all of Europe. However, one thing stood in his way to complete European domination. Russia and Britain. And Britain was hard to take for two reasons. One, she was an island. And two, her navy dominated the waves. If Hitler wanted to make Britain fail, he wouldn't have to completely invade it, he would have to starve it. And so he set about doing what the Germans did in World War I, sink convoys. In the Atlantic there was 10 convoys and Hitler needed to sink them to be able to cause Britain to starve. And so he organised this huge operation which consisted of all of his German capital ships. These ships included Bismarck, Skarnhorst, Neisnau, sorry I can't pronounce it, Prince Eugen, Hipper, Blutcher, and soon to be built Tirpitz. However, several of these ships were under repairs, Skarnhorst and Neisnau, and a lot of them were not available and Tirpitz wasn't built. So Hitler only had two ships that were available, the German heavy cruiser Prince Eugen and Bismarck. And so, they, can, they on May 19th, 1941, the two ships went out and set off on Operation Rheinberg, or Rhein meaning rainbow in German. And this was actually the first ever maiden voyage of Bismarck. And Bismarck was under command of Captain Lindemann and Admiral Gunther Lutingens. Now Lutingens was a veteran from World War One. He knew ships, he knew exactly, you know. He knew exactly, he was a man, he wasn't a man who was dedicated to Hitler or his regime, he was dedicated to his country and he believed what he was doing was right for the German people. And so what happened was that in Norway, when she was getting fitted with a camera, she was spotted by several spies, supposedly, supposedly, if you watch films like the Bismarck, and a Spitfire reconnaissance plane. And it took a picture, which I think I should have on now, of the two ships and they identified the one as cruiser but the other one they knew one was Bismarck and they knew she was going to do something dodgy. The problem was the British didn't know what she was going to do, they didn't know how she was going to do it, they didn't know anything so they had to guess and this was the most complicated game of chess. And so what happened was that Bismarck and Prince Wigan went up past Britain, past Garpa Flow, past own fleet and through the Denmark Strait. Now the British, they didn't know that she was going to do this. So there was five possible ways that she could break out in the Atlantic and the British had to cover all of them. And the thing was, the British didn't have that many ships. Half of it was in 
the Mediterranean, and it wasn't going really well because Rommel was given as hell I, during that time. And so what happened was that some of them had to be used to sort of support the troops in Africa, and they all couldn't focus in the Atlantic. And the problem was, our British ships weren't that good. British ships were underpowered in comparison to the new German ships. A lot of them were old, such as HMS Hood and Rodney, and because of the whole Treaty of Washington, and there was nothing that could be done about it. And so a lot of the ships that were built were underpowered, and nothing could be done. But the one thing that had to be done was that she had to be stopped. Now Lewin he focused on getting the mission accomplished, whereas Lindemann focused on the safety of ships. Now this you've got to take into mind throughout the entire act, the entire showdown, the entire everything. Lewin was a man who saw the mission being accomplished, and Lindemann was a man who saw the ship being accomplished. Two different things, and they were constantly at each other's throats, like telling each other what to do and whatever really when Lewin Jones was high command, so I don't know. But anyway, what happened was that the British planned it out, and they had a fleet off Iceland that consisted of King George V, Repulse, Courageous, Prince of Wales, and HMS Hood, the pride of the British Navy, the largest ever battlecruiser, the most powerful ship for 20 years. And they were split in two, with Hood and Wales going into the Denmark Strait, and the repulse and courageous and King George V at the other end. They were ready to receive Biff's remark. Hood and Prince of Wales were under the command of Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, and he knew the problems at hand with the British. He knew exactly what the problems was with the ships. Hood was the largest battlecruiser ever built and most powerful warship of the time. However, at the Battle of Jutland, it was proven that battlecruisers are not very good against battleships because they have thin deck armour. Just because a ship is faster and can fire its guns does not mean that it's going to do well against a battleship. All they got to do is get one successful hit and that ship's done. But in the end they decided to build one of her and she was the first and last kind of her to be built. And she represented the sheer power of Britain. She was sent all around the world to show British naval supremacy and she was everything to the British. Now the thing was that Hood had to fix side armour, she could take the hit side on. But she had thin deck armor, which was a huge problem, and she was supposed to be upgraded before the war. However, the war came, and financial stuff, and Britain wasn't very good because of Neville Chamberlain, and so deck armor wasn't equipped. And so she had to go in with just basically improved anti air guns, that was it. But Prince of Wales, she also had a problem, uh, and that was that all the electrics weren't running, she was breaking down, and her guns also. Um, could only fire a certain amount of times at a certain speed before they broke down and so what happened was that Captain John Leach, Leach ordered civilian contractors who were fitting out the ship to stay on board so they got dragged off to somewhere cold <laughs> right after <laughs> fitting Prince of Wales together but nevertheless they had to stop her and so the stage was set for the biggest battle in the Atlantic on the 23rd of May, cruisers HMS Suffolk and Norfolk found the Bismarck in the Strait. The Rungeons ordered Captain Lindemann of Bismarck to open fire, and her guns fired for the first time, showing the true power. The shells missed the two ships, and what happened was that they had to lay down a smoke screen and retreated and keep their distance as they went too close before. But what happened was that when they entered the strait, Bismarck and Oregon activated their hydrophones, you know, their radar, you know, to see if any ships were coming at them. And Prince Eugen picked up two fast-moving turbine ships. Lutingens knew that the British were coming, and they were coming with whatever they had. And this is when it happened. Hood and Prince of Wales found the ships they were looking for and waited for the night to get a bit better visibility in the morning. Now the plan was for the British to cross the T, which was to get all their guns facing at the enemy, and the enemy could only get their forward guns facing. However, due to problems and communication during the night, both ships ended up in the enemy's T. The Germans had all their guns pointed at the British. And so what happened was that Holland decided not to wait. Time was right. 
The spew died down. The fog died down. The visibility was correct. He saw the two German ships. He aimed his guns at them, along with Prince of Wales, and he started to close the range between the two ships. And at 5.52, on the 24th of May, one day after Norfolk and Suffolk found Bismarck, the order was given to open fire. The first shells landed short of the German ships, and Lindemann knew that they, that they intended to sink her. However, Lutingen's did nothing, and simply carried on. He knew that if he was to fight, if he were to sink the two cruisers, it would take up time, fuel, and he could risk damaging his ship. But meanwhile, the British realised they were shooting at the wrong ship. They were shooting at the leading ship, and the leading ship was Prince Eugen, not Bismarck. And they only realised, due to the size, that the other one was Bismarck, and Prince of Wales also managed to identify it. But because the ships looked so familiar, the German ships, they were firing at the wrong one the entire time, and so they redirected their fire on Bismarck. And then suddenly, the shells came at Bismarck, and they were coming closer and closer, and a distressed and angered Lindemann had had enough. He told Lutingen, he asked him twice to open whether he could open fire, and Lindemann, Lutingen said no. So he said these words, I will not let my own ship shut out from under my ass. And he gave the order to fire at 5.55, three minutes after the British started opening fire. And at that point, the wrath of the German megaship was unleashed upon the two British ships. But now, it was just basically a big lob fight. The two, the two sides were just throwing shells at each other, just hoping to hit. The British were closing the range, avoiding plunging shells, and the Germans were just firing everything. The Germans had the advantage, because they had the higher rate of fire and the better armour than the British did. But the British, they relied on their speed, and close enough, they believed in cavalry charges. That's what they believed in, and they believed that if they could close the range, then they wouldn't have plunging fire, and it could be a broadside battle royale. But after five minutes of the ships firing, a high explosive round from Eugen punched its way into the projectile locker on HMS Hood, right forward of a mast, and a huge, fiery eruption had happened, and what happened was that a fire broke out on the deck. Lancelot knew that she had been hit, but he still pressed on, and what happened was that he made the order, the fateful order, the last order, to turn 20 degrees to port, to get all of Gun Hood's guns bearing on the enemy, to get everything of the British on the Germans. And what happened was that Bismarck found the range, and a rapid fire order was given, and on a, on a fifth salvo launch, and a plunging armour piercing shell from Bismarck flew into the air and went straight down and found its mark. It went straight into the bowels of HMS Hood and through the midships and lit her up like a candle, a Roman candle to be exact, and the ship exploded. The complete midship area was just obliterated. Hood was sinking and this fiery eruption came from her and within minutes she was sinking and sinking and the bow started to rise and the stern sank separately and there wasn't the order to abandon ship because it didn't have to be given. They knew that the ship was gone. They knew that she was going to sink. That was it. They knew that Hood was sunk happened and it was just sheer chaos on Hood. And what happened was that Lancelot Holland and Captain Ralph Kerr of HMS Hood, they made no attempt to escape. They knew exactly, they did the best job they could, and they knew what was going to happen. And what happened was that HMS Hood rose vertically, surrounded by a ring of fire hell, and started her trip to the bottom, but she wasn't going down without a fight. And her turret gave one last fire before she slipped beneath the waves at 6.01. But the battle was far from over. Captain Leach saw the sinking hood before his eyes and made a turn to close the range. As Prince of Wales was firing the turrets, they started breaking down. And what happened was that one by one, they couldn't function. And Leach knew that if all of his turrets broke down, he couldn't fight. 
and he had a larger problem now. The guns of the German ships were pointing at his ship. Eugen and Bismarck, they threw everything at the Prince of Wales and she was taking hits everywhere. There was eight confirmed hits on her, some not detonating, some hitting below the waterline. She was just getting ripped apart. But Wales still engaged Bismarck and she managed to score two or three hits. Everybody argues about who shot who. Some people say like HMS Hood shot Bismarck. I, I honestly don't know. I don't know. All right, I wasn't there. We don't know. We're not gonna know all the credits. But they finally got the range on her and all they had to do was just simply a shell from Bismarck ripped straight through the bridge and killed several men on board. But Captain Leach was still alive. Bloodied and battered, he realized that he wasn't gonna win and all of his turrets were out of action. So at 6.05, Prince of Wales laid down a smoke screen to escape the German ships. Lindemann wanted to chase down the injured Prince of Wales and sink her, but Lutingen said no, wanting to see the operation succeed, and they moved on. After two hours of HMS Hood sinking, HMS Electra finally arrived on the scene and was ready to receive tons of men, tons of injured, dying men. But to their shock, only three men out of 1,419 made it. They were Ted Briggs, Robert Tilburn, and William John Dundas. The Prince of Wales followed the Bismarck with the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk, but after the guns broke, she pulled off, and there was nothing more she could do. Lindemann was happy. His ship was able to hold off the enemy and the mission could be a success but she had damage done to her her fuel was being contaminated by seawater she couldn't go into the atlantic she would risk running out of fuel and then the ship would be useless now lindemann he wanted to go back to norway he thought it's far too dangerous there's going to be more ships go back the way we came lutingens said no 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 i'm in command we're going abreast, baby. And he didn't use those words exactly. And that was in occupied France. If he got to Brest, he would have the whole Atlantic at his disposal. And he could go out with Scharnhorst and Gneissei and Prince Eugen once she finished raiding convoys. However, Lutingens knew it was wrong to sink Hood. Hood was the pride of the British Navy. The symbol of Britain, of power, and he knew that the British would not let this go unpunished. And he was right. Churchill called the fleet command and told them that he doesn't care how they do it, he doesn't care who is risked in the matter, he told them that everything is at stake. The Navy had to sink Bismarck. And not just for Britain's sake, but for HMS Hood's sake. Show me next time how the British got back over HUD and how planes dominated the Bismarck and how, at the end of the day, the guns fell silent and the Bismarck was sunk.